James Beckworth heads west a newly freed slave, looking for adventure. He finds more than anyone could have imagined, becoming a celebrated mountain man and a war chief of the Crow Nation. But no one becomes a chief without making a few enemies. You intend to murder me as well. Well, stop that test! And after over a decade in the mountains, Beckworth returns home to St. Louis with a price on his head. Good to see you, sir. That's the pro we've been looking for. Let's take a scout, boys. Well, boys, indeed I am a crow. And if it's my scalp that you want, then come and take it. James Beckworth may not be a household name, but he's one of the greatest of all mountain men, with a decade-spanning career as a trapper, hunter, scout, and businessman. And Jim Beckworth was a man who was literally all over the country, all over the West, had his fingers in so many different parts of that, that Western expansion experience. He accomplished such things as discovering the uh, Beckworth Pass over the Northern Sierras, which uh, made it easier for immigrants going into California. He was just such an amazing man. But Beckworth doesn't just wear many hats. He also lives multiple different lives. Born into slavery, he finds freedom in the wilderness beyond the Mississippi and a new home among the Crow tribe. We're used to thinking about frontier heroes as having one foot in two worlds, as being part of the wilderness, but also being part civilized and having a struggle, an interior struggle of how to reconcile these two competing impulses. It's very likely that Beckworth was somebody who was negotiating three or maybe more worlds. He saw the whole spectra of the West. He did it with an extreme sense of uh, humor, tremendous curiosity, a supreme intelligence, and supreme physical ability. So I see a guy that's constantly animated by his soul and his intellect and absolute courage. Like many other mountain men, Beckworth's journey begins in St. Louis. But unlike so many others who head west, Jim Beckworth is African-American and a slave. His father was a white plantation owner, and his mother was one of this man's slaves. Hey, Jim, we got four of these we're going to rework today. Yes, sir. Yet Beckworth yearns for an opportunity to head west and follow the footsteps of the frontiersman he sees daily in the workshop. That'll be 10 bits. St. Louis was kind of a gateway into the West. And so a lot of those traders that are going to go up river are going to need some things made by blacksmiths. So it's very likely that Beckworth had interactions with them there. Most men in Beckworth's situation would never be able to live free on the frontier. but his relationship with his father is unusually close. Most 
slave owners, when they had children with their slaves, they uh, would not acknowledge that, but Jim's dad did. He never denied that Jim was his son. And he went to court and actually freed Jim and his two sisters. Having gained his freedom, Beckworth wastes no time finding his way to the frontier, little suspecting that he's starting a life of extraordinary adventure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Beckworth joins a fur company led by a legendary fur trader named William Ashley. Working alongside other young mountain men like Jim Bridger, Jedediah Smith, and Tom Fitzpatrick, Beckworth quickly builds a reputation as a man with potential. Bridger and uh, Fitzpatrick and Jedi Smith were all dumping into the experience about the same time. And I would imagine recruiting for a professional football team or baseball team, they're all alpha males. And so you're, you're tagging each other and checking each other out. Beckworth forms a lasting friendship with trapper Tom Fitzpatrick, who will one day become a frontier legend in his own right. And like Fitzpatrick, he quickly earns the trust and respect of William Ashley. Jim. I spoke to General Ashley. He wants you to lead one of the trapper parties. I believe the general will be disappointed. It's my first trip to the mountains, Fitz. There are other men better qualified than me. I told him you'd say no. But when you're ready to lead, there are men ready to follow you. Whether or not Beckworth was actually invited to lead a trapping brigade of his own can't be known for sure. Much of what is known about his amazing career comes from his autobiography, which often strains belief when he describes his prowess and bravery in the wild. Late in his life, he meets a journalist who he spends the next year or so dictating his life story to, and it's published in 1856. There weren't very many, you know, first-person narrations of, of the adventures of mountain men, so it's very important. However, he was noted to be an exaggerator. A lot of historians have kind of poo-pooed his memoirs, but they provide a lot of information about what he was doing uh, in the mountains in the 1820s and 30s. And most of what Beckworth tells us about really happened. And in his fantastical memoir, Beckworth reveals the events that changed his life forever. <laughs> As Beckworth tells it, it all starts with a joke told by his friend, Caleb Greenwood. Beckworth is part of a trapping party with Caleb Greenwood when they encounter members of the Absaliga tribe, also known as the Crows. Hey, so him right there, that is Jim Beckworth. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, we just got a little love. Uh... Caleb, he had married a Crow woman, and her family was always wanting to hear the stories, you know, the tales, and Caleb decided he'd tell him the biggest whopper he could think of. Jim, Jim, hey. Uh, those crows over there, they won't meet you. <laughs> Why? But you tell them, Caleb. <laughs> well, they was asking about that fight we got into with the Blackfeet and want to know who took the most scalps and such. And I just got tired, you know, sore of answering so many questions. And I told them uh, you was crow. And they believed you? Well, remember when you was a little crow boy? and the Cheyennes took you, they want to hear all about it. This isn't funny, you know. 
kind of funny. <laughs> kind of, okay. It just seems like a joke at the time, but Greenwood and certainly Beckworth have no idea how that one moment of humor will fundamentally shape Beckworth's life for the next eight years. Not long after Greenwood tells his tall tale to the crows, Beckworth heads out to trap in crow country, breaking away from the brigade to work alone. And when a party of armed warriors approaches, Beckworth is faced with a life or death choice. Fight or surrender and hope for the best. Beckworth knows the crows are usually friendly to trappers, but not always. Now he has no idea if he's their guest or their captive. Beckworth doesn't speak Crow, but it's apparent the Crows believe he could, in fact, be a long-lost member of the tribe. All these Crows surround Beckworth, and then one of the guys goes, oh, he's the long-lost Crow. This is the guy Greenwood tells us about. And all of the women who had children captured surround him, and they're, they're looking him over, you know, looking at every hand. One of the ladies says, that's my son, that's my son. That woman simply assumed that Jim was her real son. And they took him into their family. As Beckworth relates in his memoirs, a Crow chief named Big Bull and his wife adopt him into their village. It's a remarkable story, and it's also convenient in a number of respects. We know that Beckworth was in debt to the fur company, and then he wanted to strike out on his own as a free trapper. Obviously, having access to the Crow country as a member of the Crow would, of course, be to his benefit. Whether by accident or design, Beckworth's been accepted by the Crows and could make his fortune by bringing their trade to the highest bidder. But to do so, he needs to earn prestige and influence among the warlike tribe by risking his life in bloody combat. Soon after his adoption by the Crows, James Beckworth embarks on a series of challenges to earn his reputation as a warrior and leader. Beckworth obviously was an alpha male, and when he entered the Crow, he entered a very martial world in which the only respect you could hold had to be based on your, your skills. For young men that wanted to achieve chieftainship, they had to count coup in four different ways. They had to touch their enemy with a weapon in battle and get away. Counting coup usually didn't involve killing your opponent. You go up to your opponent, you declare victory over them in some kind of a fight, and then you both live to tell that story. But proving physical courage is only one of the four trials Beckworth faces to become a war chief. They had to take an enemy horse from a camp. They had to lead a successful war party with men involved and to take horses or what have you. Horses became the primary source of wealth for native people because with them, you could do whatever you wanted. And they understood that if their rivals had horses and they didn't, then they would be at their mercy. 
Beckworth has not only grown into a leader among the crows, he has also learned their language. You know about Kamalehi de Kaolo, Ukaja. If we return with these horses, the village will rejoice in the strength of your medicine. Let's go get them. Beckworth now has a successful raid under his belt, and he continues to rack up coups. Killing an opponent, although that wasn't initially the most important part, does become part of counting coup. With the crows in near constant conflict with their ancient enemies, the Blackfeet, Beckworth has no lack of opportunities to prove himself. Another way you could get coup was to pull a gun or a weapon out of their hands, a bow. Or you could become a successful leader in, in a war engagement. Once a person achieves all of those things, they're eligible, they're seen as an experienced war leader and a chief. But as Beckworth gains respect and esteem among the crows, he never loses sight of the world he left behind. Beckworth is looking to set out on his own as what's called a free trapper, a trapper who doesn't trap for one of the big companies, but is simply independent. Beckworth hasn't entirely given up his connection to the world of trappers and traders. He leads the Crows to Fort Clark, a trading post run by the powerful American Fur Company, to cash in their peltry. Because of here, Pisha. Hey, put that down. Put it down. down. Because of here, Pisha. I don't speak Crow. Is it here? Hey, hey, put it down. He tries to be a heat shot. Sir, this man wants scarlet cloth. You're no crow. No, I'm not. My name in English is James Beckworth. Beckworth. Thought you were dead. As you can see, I live and I breathe. As a member of the Crow tribe, he can bring their entire fur trade to the company of his choosing. Now, sir, I have watched how you conduct the business around here. I've not said a word. But we have toiled long and hard for what we have obtained, and we want the full worth of our earnings. Or else my partners over here may decide to strike a deal of their own. Okay. You want scarlet cloth? Here. He parlays that into becoming an agent for the American Fur Company, saying, look, I'll get all these guys to come to your trading post, and I'll get them to trap more, and you just pay me a little bit on the side. American Fur, which was originally owned by John Jacob Astor, their whole goal was to dominate the trade. And American fur had control of most of the fur trade in the upper Missouri. Beckworth strikes a deal with Kenneth McKenzie, an American fur company agent, to deliver the Crow's trade. Mr. McKenzie? James. Good day to you, sir. Having made a deal with the powerful American fur company. Much obliged, sir. Thank you. 
and bring back all the fur the crews can trap. Excellent. Beckworth uses his influence as a war chief to persuade the crows to trap beaver instead of raiding their enemies. For a while, he and the crows are able to bring in large quantities of beaver furs. Yet the truce is short-lived. Before long, violence between the crows and Blackfeet resumes. And as a war chief with a reputation to defend, Beckworth joins in the fighting with a will. But in this battle, Beckworth meets someone who will change his life. A remarkable woman warrior, every bit as fearless as himself. Living as a member of the Crow Nation, James Beckworth is drawn deeper and deeper into war, despite his efforts to focus on trapping and making money. In battle, Beckworth finds glory, prestige, and excitement, but he also finds something he wasn't expecting a formidable new ally named Pineleaf. Pineleaf was a crow woman, and in her childhood, the Blackfeet had killed her family. So she took a vow that she would not marry until she had collected 100 Blackfeet scalps. I wouldn't want to arm wrestle even the average crow woman. They were powerful women, but Pineleaf apparently was an exceptional and a dedicated woman warrior. And while Jim was there, he was absolutely enchanted with her. Beckworth and Pineleaf become partners in battle, always fighting by each other's side. But Beckworth wants Pineleaf to join her life to his. Defeating the Blackfeet will not be an easy task. Has your medicine told you if we will return victorious? I believe we will. And if we escape death and return safely, will you marry me then? You know my vow. Do you suppose I should break it and fail to avenge my brother's death? Of course not. But my medicine has never lied. And it tells me that I must marry. And in that way, I will never fall in battle. I will marry you as you ask. Once we return. When the pine leaves turn yellow. Oh. Uh. It occurs to me that pine leaves never grow yellow. <laughs> There's the question of whether pine leaf really does exist. A lot of tribes have stories of women who were warriors. The Comanche, the Grovant, the Crow, of course. Uh, the Grovant person I mentioned was known as Woman Chief, and she is captured by the crow in her teen years. And a lot of historians say that this pine leaf character might actually be the woman chief person. It's hard to say, you know, you've got to filter through, you know, Beckworth's story and, and kind of pick a side. Beckworth and pine leaf make a fearsome pair on the battlefield. And as the years pass, they grow closer and closer. With a reputation for bravery and even a potential wife among the crows, Beckworth's new life on the frontier is nearly complete. But that life of freedom is abruptly challenged by the unexpected arrival of an old friend. Fitz. Beckwith. <laughs> oh. I'd heard you'd gone, Crow. But I 
it's still hard to believe my eyes. So, what brings you here to Crow Country? I'm uh, showing these gentlemen what wonders can be found west of the Mississippi. Sir William Drummond Stewart. This is Jim Beckworth, as excellent a hunter or trapper as ever lived. Among Fitzpatrick's company is an important man, Sir William Drummond Stewart, who was a Scottish military man who spent years adventuring across the American West. I wouldn't have taken you for a crow, sir. My father's a crow. My brothers and sisters here are crows. I suppose that makes me a crow as well. What Beckworth doesn't know is that some of his Crow Confederates notice something about the horses that Fitzpatrick and his party have with them. Those are horses that had been stolen from them by the Cheyenne in a recent skirmish. One of Beckworth's Crow allies sees a horse that belonged to his father, who was slain fighting with the Cheyenne. And worse, the warrior believes Fitzpatrick's men fought alongside the Crow's enemies. Come on, you two, come on. Fitzpatrick accompanies Beckworth and his braves back to the Crow village, but Beckworth is unaware of the growing tension as he catches up with his old friend. Beckworth and Fitzpatrick came up together in the fur trade, but now they find themselves on opposite sides of the business. Beckworth works for the American Fur Company, whereas Fitzpatrick is one of the owners of the Rocky Mountain Fur Company. So these are friends, but now, because of their business associations, rivals. There has to be some underlying tension. Seems you've uh, made a life for yourself here, Jim. How long's it been? Four, almost five years. I mean, they... See you as a leader, that's clear. Well, I mean, they, they listen to you. Sometimes they do. It's a hard life, it's. I wanna hunt and trap and sell my piltry. But scarcely have I laid down my war club when I find I must pick it up again. You know these people, they're not long for this world anymore. But you can come back. With us. My body is here, amongst the crows. Sometimes, my mind is very far away. But even as Beckworth and Fitzpatrick discuss their shared history, the young braves have been spoiling for a fight. <laughs> and they decide to strike without Beckworth's permission. Fitzpatrick left Stewart in charge of the group, and the Crow warriors come in there with Fitzpatrick gone. To what do we owe the pleasure of this unexpected visit? You know how bad. Ba, amale walaka. Ko, uwawajia. Baku. Chuma. Stuart doesn't offer any resistance because, for one, he's outnumbered, and two, he was afraid that if he did try anything, they'd all get killed. I'll tell you this only once. Leave this place now. You know how bad Bilal, Wachiadala, Biwichia, Kotosala, Maitiasa. They were purposely trying to get the white traders and the trappers to strike first, and Stuart didn't play that game and didn't fall into that trap. The crows, they gleaned and circled, and then they intimidated, and then they literally took everything they had and took it back to the village. But Stuart's restraint has an unintended consequence that thrusts Beckworth into the center of the conflict. Because no coups were counted on the trappers, the warriors believe the horse theft has not been avenged with honor. And the next morning, they set out to right this wrong. Mr. Wrong, 
The white traitors. The Braves are gonna kill them all. With deadly violence between his Crow family and Trapper friends all but certain, Beckworth's torn by conflicting loyalties, a conflict that might cost him his life. A visit from an old friend, Thomas Fitzpatrick, throws James Beckworth's life with the Crows into chaos. A group of young Crow warriors believe Fitzpatrick is responsible for the deaths of their fathers and brothers. And they have taken his horses, furs, and supplies in retribution. What is the law? The white traitors. The Braves are gonna kill them all. What happens next is one of Beckworth's finest moments, at least according to his memoirs. In most versions of the story, Fitzpatrick negotiates with the Crows to return his stolen property. But that's not how Beckworth tells it. Jim? Fitz, where you man? All dead, I expect. You intend to murder me as well. What you talking about? My men are running for their lives down the river. Your crows intend on killing them. Do you expect me to believe you know nothing of this? Fitz, I swear to you, I had nothing to do with that. Nothing. These Indians listen to you, Jim. If you told them to take our horses, our peltry, for the benefit of your paymaster at the American Fur Company, they surely would. Pray that they do listen to me, Fitz. Or else your men are as good as dead. In Beckworth's telling, he learns that the Crow warriors will not be satisfied simply with having recovered the horses, that they intend to kill Fitzpatrick's men, and that only his presence will save them from death. Stay here in the village. My father will ensure that no harm comes to you. Where are you going? You may be going to my death. Beckworth races to intercept Fitzpatrick's Scottish guest, Sir William Drummond Stewart, before the other crows can kill him and the rest of his men. just as the confrontation is about to turn bloody. Hold yourself! Hold yourself! Hold yourself! Hold yourself right now! Do you wish these whites to live? They killed my father! After you have killed me, you can march over my dead body and kill them. Not before. Not before. You better come with me, you better come with me now. I will go with no wretch. Beckworth inserts himself into this conflict and orders Stuart and the other man to line up behind him, thereby sending a signal that they're in his care. He's captured them and they have his protection. I will go by him, no bloody rascal! And any man who will live on such wretches is a bloody right. rascal! But Stuart, according to Beckworth, doesn't want to do this. Stuart thinks that Beckworth has orchestrated the whole thing. In fact, Stuart wants to shoot Beckworth for this apparent treachery, not knowing that if Beckworth dies, Fitzpatrick Stewart and all the other men die with him. Now, only Beckworth can prevent a massacre, but with one false move, he could become the first man to die. You better come with me now. No, I will go with no wretch. And any man who will live on such wretches is a bloody rascal. James Beckworth is caught literally between his Crow family and his trapper friends. And there may be nothing he can do to prevent a violent collision. You can come with me, or you can stay here and die. In Beckworth's recounting, Stuart is highly suspicious of Beckworth because of his association with the Indians. Now, that's certainly possible.
prejudice undeniably existed at that time, and maybe Stuart would have been more likely to fall prey to it, having been more of a tourist in the American West than an inhabitant. Fine. I shall go with you. It's Beckworth who is, in fact, their hero. He's saving them. Let's go! By inserting himself into the conflict, by making sure that the other crow see him riding with Stuart, he's saving their lives because the other crow will interpret that as them being his prisoners and therefore under his protection. To keep the peace, Beckworth orders his braves to search the village for Fitzpatrick's stolen goods and return them to their owners. Fitzpatrick is not a happy man, and he was under dire threat. And the only reason they probably weren't upended and killed is because of Beckworth. He totally immersed himself in the Crow world and did everything necessary to hold his position. So when he was dealing with Fitzpatrick, uh, they all looked to him for leadership. Though Fitzpatrick gets most of his property back, he blames Beckworth for instigating the nearly fatal conflict. Once you leave this village, it is no longer in my power to stop the crows from following you. Oh, not in your power, is it? Ride for three days without stopping the camp. That should put you out of reach. Thank you, Jim. I'll keep my own counsel about when to stop. Fitz, listen to me. I am sorry about what happened, but I've done as much for you as I would for my father or my brothers. Which father, Jim? Which brothers? Come on. Come on. Beckworth is at a crossroads. His former friends have become enemies. Pineleaf still refuses to marry him. And after over a decade in the wilderness, he misses his home and his family. He decides to finally return to St. Louis. Well, St. Louis has certainly grown quite a bit by that time, from the time he left in 24. And uh, Beckworth probably was looking for things that he remembered from 12 years ago that weren't there anymore. Beckworth, a man who has spent his life crossing between different worlds, may no longer have a home in any of them. Good to see you, sir. And if he thinks he left war behind in Crow Country, he is mistaken. That's the Crow we've been looking for. Seeking revenge for his humiliation in Crow Country, Fitzpatrick sends assassins looking for Beckworth, and they find him during the intermission of a play. Let's take a scout, boys. Beckworth's about to find out that civilization can be just as deadly as the wilderness. Let's take a scout, boys. The bad blood between James Beckworth and his former friend, Tom Fitzpatrick, has followed him home to St. Louis. Still angry over their confrontation in Crow Country, Fitzpatrick sends assassins after Beckworth to take revenge. Beckworth is caught without his Crow Braves by his side, 
Now, he has to improvise. Well, boys. Come on. Take one more step, and you'll see who Scott gets taken. All right, boys, the party's over. The local sheriff stops the fight before it can go any further. And Beckworth knows that if he pushes it too far, he could wind up in jail. No trouble here. These gentlemen and I were just having a friendly conversation. You're more than welcome to join me out in the street. You'd like to continue it. Beckworth, let's go. I think I'll skip the second act. It's a boring play anyway. Beckworth can no longer call St. Louis home, but his life among the crows is over as well. In his life, it came a time that he wanted to change because he was a very adventurous uh, person and he wanted new adventure. Beckworth will write many more chapters in his story over the next few decades, always pushing beyond the frontier, searching for a new world to conquer. He goes and works with the Army in the Seminole Wars. He ends up in the gold rush, running a store. He finds a pass across the Sierra that helps immigrants make it. I mean, this guy is just going, 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 and constantly finding some new way to impact the world around him. I think for those of us contemporary Crow Indians who know about his story, there's a great deal of respect and an admiration for him. This was the last gasp of the Crow Nation. They were only within a generation or two not be able to live this life anymore. He would have been one of the singular figures of that last epic that played a major role in the tribe's survival. The whole idea of the American West, the whole idea of the frontier is a metaphor for all of us to get beyond the familiar, to find the complete capacity of what an individual is capable of doing. Beckworth, more than any other person, sustained that. He put so much effort into this country's expansion. He was a real part of that. I think he should be remembered as one of the uh, OS heroes. He was a hero.